So I do place in my own view, and it's somewhat developed in my book, Governing Through Crime, and I, put, uh, I would put the most significant weight on essentially the politics side of politics and economics. Uh, as you can see, mass incarceration requires legal policy changes, as well as non-explicit uh, but nonetheless very visible changes in uh, essentially discretionary, the use of discretion by pol uh, political figures like prosecutors and whatnot. So the question we might ask is, what, what causes political leaders uh, in roughly the late 70s, early 80s to view uh, the idea of building a lot of prisons and filling those prisons with uh, people that are viewed as dangerous, as threats to the community, what makes that such a compelling idea right then? And I think um, there's a number of factors that, uh, that play into that kind of political opportunity, right? One of them is the kind of economy, right? If we go back to the start for, uh, to the, uh, you know, this timeline for a moment, um, you know, this figure, this, this early 70s to mid-70s period where we're kind of beginning our, our movement upwards in imprisonment rates is a period of, of, of tremendous economic restructuring in America and essentially the beginning of the sense of fiscal crisis and the fact that the state doesn't have any money or the federal government doesn't have any money to do anything new and that we need to maybe cut taxes and that we have a lot of deficit concerns. That all really begins here. And one of the, and it doesn't leave us, right, until the present time, it's still a big part of our political life, the sense of a constraint partly brought on by competitive changes in the world market. It's not, you know, something that's going away. Obviously, it's been with us for some decades. One of the things that does is it means that government, when it tries to address the kinds of uh, anxieties that have been a part of modern political life all through the 20th century, especially economic anxieties, doesn't have a whole lot of, uh, beginning in the 70s, but doesn't have a whole lot of uh, uh, capacity to turn to some of its historic approaches to, it, to addressing people's anxiety. Uh, regulation. Well, regulation's uh, getting to be seen as part of the problem that's uh, keeping our economy kind of uh, 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 paralyzed in the 70s. Uh, greater levels of spending on education and welfare to, to sort of improve the prospects of the rising generation. Uh, well, that costs money. And in a time of budget cutting and lower taxes, uh, that doesn't look very promising. So what, you know, what can government do uh, to show that it really cares about people, to address real anxieties in their lives? Crime control, I argue, is a kind of godsend to politicians because people really care about it. It's something they can understand. There's a lot of powerful examples in the 60s and 70s of scary criminals. Any of you watch Mad Men, the Mad Men series at all? That must be a generational thing. Okay. Um, but they, the last episode dealt with sort of uh, some of the scary murders in the summer of 1966, like the Richard Spector murder of nurses in uh, Chicago. But there was lots of reasons for people to be scared about crime. The crime rate had gone up very considerably. There was a lot of visible crime in the news, like Manson, the Manson murders in LA. So politicians could address that. They could appear to be very vigorous. They could offend no powerful constituencies, right? Because criminals don't have a significant lobby and nobody's really concerned. If you want to have a uh, war on pollution, well, that's going to hurt you know, chemical companies and uh, industrial plants in the Midwest, and there's going to be strong interest. If you have a war on poverty, uh, that's going to you know, gore somebody's ox or their ox is going to gore you. Uh, forget that metaphor. Uh, the point is, when you make a war on crime, uh, there's not a whole lot of people that are against you. Uh, and so it's politically very attractive. And here's the beautiful part from the point of view of politicians, say here in the 80s, when you change the laws to send people to prison for 20 years instead of two years, you don't have to pay for that for a very long time. It, it takes a while before the people accumulate in prison. So it's people like Nancy Skinner today in the legislature who have to figure out, they're the ones that look incompetent over here because they can't figure out what to do about, uh, what to do about a huge prison population uh, and a huge you know, deficit, decisions which were made way back here. Right? So I think that that helps explain it. But you can't, you know, as in all aspects of American politics, you cannot understate the importance of race. And that's one of the reasons I uh, wanted to read Professor Bacon's contribution. Uh, fear of crime from the beginning of American history uh, exists in a direct kind of uh, relationship to fear of a usually racialized other Native Americans, especially the, the slaves that, that were brought to America and eventually the freed slaves. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's clearly apropos that, you know, this period again, the 70s, uh, when you begin to get this shift, is one of sort of significant civil rights uh, victories and also uh, backlashes. And uh, a lot of uh, criminologists and sociologists differ about how to understand that relationship. Some would argue uh, that mass incarceration is essentially a replacement for the Jim Crow uh, system of racial subordination. That's some Michelle Alexander's argument in the very forcefully uh, presented uh, New Jim Crow, which is a, you know, the rare thing in the world of criminology, sociology, of law, a bestseller. I just saw like, a stack of them at the airport uh, as I was traveling uh, over the weekend. Uh, so a very, a, very, a very compelling story about that. Uh, but civil rights, uh, the, the victories of civil rights are as important as the backlash in explaining, I think, why mass incarceration was so popular. Because when you put people in prison, especially on this kind of categoric basis, one of the things that looks attractive about that is you're treating everybody equally, or at least you appear to be. So anyone who committed this crime with this criminal record is going to prison. Now, we know that the things that get you into court are not going to be so equally distributed and access to good lawyers, et cetera. But at least superficially, there was a sense of uh, fit with the goal of a more egalitarian society. It was true with treating women more the same as men, which meant giving them longer prison sentences than they had had in the past. So um, I think um, there's a very limited value uh, to trying to identify some particular combination of factors that cause mass incarceration. People try to do that by using multiple regression techniques and looking at variations in state because the states really vary. Some states have maybe only doubled their prison population, others like California quintupled it. But it's very, very hard to actually control for all the factors in a way that give you a very satisfying answer. And more importantly, it's not clear that if you ran the experiment again, it would come out the same way. I think it's actually more helpful to think about it as a set of risk factors. That is, uh, building up a massive prison population is an attractive kind of policy change uh, and uh, the, its relative attractiveness is going to be dependent on a number of things that include the economic constraints that are preventing government from doing other kinds of things, the level of anxiety about race and uh, social change that are uh, around. It happens that the 70s are a sort of extreme moment of all of that, um, but I'm not saying that if those conditions necessarily came about in a different country, you would find mass incarceration. Indeed, as we saw with the, the neoliberal the chart here of, uh, of countries, that, uh, a lot of countries that have followed the U.S. in uh, liberal being liberal market economies, you know, aren't that different. Uh, they haven't had anything like mass incarceration. England and Wales, which is perhaps the closest to us in this regard, has also maybe experienced the highest increase in its incarceration rates. Uh, and so I don't want to downplay that too much. But I think it suggests that there is a lot of contingency, a lot of role for culture, and a lot of role also for institutional politics. One of the big differences between the U.S. and some of these other countries here is that these other countries don't have the incredibly uh, populist kind of politics we do, where prison sentences are affected by you know, locally elected prosecutors, elected assembly members, elected judges, elected governors. In England, for instance, you know, prison sentences are pretty much dependent on which party is elected the head of Westminster in Parliament, right? And so you have a much more of an opportunity for sort of elite uh, control and bargaining, etc. Here in the U.S., there's a much uh, more of a tendency toward electoral competition about a crime. All right, that was a long-winded, uh, uh, but let me turn,
I take this model from uh, a chapter of Kami in a book I've edited, uh, and chapters like this for Wildman and Christopher Mueller, uh, uh, once of both of Harvard. Uh, in any event, it just gives you a general model of how we might think about the role of mass incarceration in affecting inequality. So to think about this in formal terms, we've got equality at time one, and how it affects both the likelihood of punishment, but also the likelihood of being unequal, you know, uh, on the wrong side of unequal, uh, at uh, times two and three, right? So one thing to notice is that your inequality at time three, say after you've gotten out of prison, is partly determined by your inequality at Time one, maybe I should stop saying inequality and say your poverty, right? Being on the wrong side of a very unequal division of wealth. Being poor at time one partly uh, uh, determines uh, the likelihood that you'll be poor at time three. It's possible that you'll be rich at time three. Maybe you'll buy one of those lottery tickets at time two uh, that we just found out about that will make you a millionaire, and then you'll be out of that even if you were in prison. So these are obviously general processes. Now, we're interested in how punishment, as an event that happens in between poverty at time one and your situation economically uh, at time three, how does that affect it? It obviously goes along with the fact that your poverty is already having an influence on it, uh, uh, reproducing itself. And the model suggests there are two different ways that punishment at time two could uh, contribute to the likelihood of your being poor at time three. One is through uh, transformation. That is, something about the way your behavior or your personality changes when you're in prison is going to make you less capable of escaping poverty at time three than you would otherwise have been. All right? You're already, you know, if you're poor at time one, there's a good chance you missed out on the kind of educational opportunities and other things that will help you escape poverty at time three. Um, but if you've been in prison, those conditions may have changed you in ways that make you even less likely to present wealth to an employer, to attract a potential marriage partner, uh, or to do other things that will improve your prospects. But there's also the stigma of uh, being um, in prison. Uh, lots of employers don't want to hire somebody who's been in prison no matter what they, they present. They might look like uh, a movie star might present with tremendous uh, personality uh, skills and attractiveness. But if they check the box that says they've been in prison, then uh, they may not want to hire them at all. So that's the general model. Obviously, poverty can also affect your selection for prison. That's the number one up there. So this gives you just a general sense of, of, of the model. There's a no model at all. Um, and now I'm going to draw on some of the, uh, the very interesting uh, tables and figures presented by uh, uh, Western and Pettit uh, in the piece I asked you to read for today. I'm going to spend most of my time talking about the economic uh, inequality effects of mass incarceration, uh, of incarceration, well, of incarceration, with the caveat that mass incarceration means that it has uh, moved that experience out to many more people than used to have it. So this is a very interesting figure here that lets us see, um, first of all, how, um, going back for a moment to our, our model, how sort of factors that uh, influence inequality or, or features of poverty, if you will, um, can affect punishment. That's the selection factor that we were just talking about, right? So um, notice, and this is showing you whites, <laughs> Latinos, and blacks at two different times, that is, at two different cohorts, we should say, of people who we've been, who the, uh, uh, these uh, scientists have been tracking in census data, basically. You've got people uh, who were aged 20 to 34, let's call them sort of young adults, you all seem young to me at 20 to 34, in 1980, versus people that were 20 to 34 uh, in 2008. So you can do the math. Uh, the people who were 20 to 34 in 1980 were people like me. I would have been one of those people who were born in the late 50s, early 60s. Uh, the people who were uh, 20 to 34 in 2008 would have been the people who were born in the 80s uh, or uh, late 70s. So it represents two different cohorts of people, um, and we're looking at them, uh, we're breaking them down in terms of race, and we're breaking them down in terms of uh, educational attainment. And there's a few things to notice here. So first of all, the changes from 1980 to 2008 um, in terms of the experience of these two, two different cohorts, have varied uh, a lot, as you might uh, expect, in regard to race. Uh, it, it's true that uh, whites are more likely, uh, and we'll see that in a moment, uh, they're more likely to go to prison in 2008 than they were, that is, the, the, the whites that were young adults in 2008 were more likely to have been to prison than whites that were young adults in 1980, uh, but a, a whole lot less than with uh, Latinos and especially with African-Americans. So we can actually look at that, uh, that figure. So if you look at uh, whites, uh, and this is take all educational category here, whites, uh, and this is a somewhat different uh, cohorts here. This is looking at people well, born from 1945 to 49 versus people born from 75 to 79. Some overlap are a little different. But just notice that uh, whites go from in 19, those born in 1945 to 49, sort of front-edge front baby boomers like Bill Clinton, 1.4% of them um, would have uh, had a 1.4% chance that they would have been to prison by the time they're 34. In the 1975 cohort, people born some 30 years later, 5.4 times, 5.4%. Uh, Still not a very large percent chance that they'll go to prison, one out of 20, but more than four times the chance uh, in, uh, in that earlier cohort. So uh, it makes a difference no matter what race you are, but a much bigger difference. If we look at uh, uh, then, uh, uh, blacks uh, going from about 10%, which is like 10 times as many in, uh, than whites, to uh, the cohort born in 1975-79, more than a quarter of uh, black men uh, will have been to prison by the time that they're 34 in that later cohort. So race does make a big difference. But going back to this slide for a moment, so does educational attainment. And, and, and importantly, educational attainment very much seems to mediate the effects of race on the likelihood of incarceration. So look at the fact that among uh, people in college, there's some difference here. Um, the, in, again, taking the 2008 figure, you know, so the white college person has got about a, you know, less than 1% chance of uh, a black a young male, young adult male with college education, something more like a 2% chance a difference. But we're still talking about relatively minor exposure to prison, much more so when we get to folks that are, <coughs> have only finished high school but not college. And then take a look at the high school dropouts. I think they are really um, the staggering figure here, that you see that um, both in the sheer level of it and in the growth from 1980, uh, a black uh, young, uh, a young adult, uh, uh, African-American who was uh, in, uh, a young adult in 1980, uh, had about 10% about chance of being in prison, about 1 in 10 in prison, by the, uh, if they were a high school dropout. Uh, by the time you get uh, in 2008, uh, black males in that same category, young, young adults uh, without a high school diploma, it's 35% um, uh, are incarcerated. And if you treat that as a lifetime average, uh, uh, and again, this is a slightly different cohorts, if you take a look here at the lifetime, the cumulative risk, I'm sorry, strike lifetime, the cumulative risk of being uh, to, uh, uh, to prison. Um, let's see if that's actually the best. Um, uh, yes, there But look at the, the high school dropout figure uh, for this 1975-79 cohort. 68% were uh, essentially uh, 
uh, uh, odds of going to prison sometime in your life uh, by the time you're odds of having been to prison, I should say, by the time you're 34 are 68 percent. So uh, essentially two thirds uh, of of young adult, uh, of la young black adult males born in 1975 and 79, two thirds of them that did not finish high school went to prison. Uh, that is extraordinary. That means you're not talking about you know very significant development. You're not even talking about a majority development. You're talking about a super majority uh, of people in that category, which you know in high school didn't used to be. Finishing high school didn't used to be seen as a absolute necessity to, to survive in America. It's becoming that. But you can see that part of that is the incarceration risk uh, involved. So um, actually, before I move on to the effect of incarceration on um, wealth and on mobility, a little bit more time with um, uh, with this. A couple of points to make about this. Um, so uh, one is you know race makes a big big difference. So look at the most disadvantaged group, the uh, high school dropouts. Um, two thirds of African American men in that category have been to prison, less than a third of, of whites. So it's a, it, you know, it essentially doubles your odds going to prison. This is one of the reasons that Louis Bacon, you know, is uneasy talking about mass incarceration. He says this is very selective incarceration. Uh, minorities, but especially African Americans, again, think about Trayvon Martin, right? We say, well, the guy who shot him or may not have been white even. But being black is very distinctive in terms of this kind of crime fear based uh, issue in America. Very different even than the Latino risk, notice that less than whites, partly because they're working, they're more likely to be working or in agricultural areas. But in any event, race makes a big, big difference. And that leads Bacon to say, well, maybe we should talk about hyper incarceration because mass implies uh, kind of uniformity or expansive. Uh, uh, equal distribution. I want to keep the mass incarceration because, again, look at the white, a third of white males without a high school diploma have been to prison in that cohort by the time they're 34. That's hardly, you know, a system designed to maintain white privilege as a prime goal, right? You're taking whites with little education, you're subjecting them in very large numbers, not as large. And I think a lot of that is because of the policing strategies. If you're a, a, a white male who's a high school dropout, you're much more likely to be living in a neighborhood that is not uniformly poor. Whereas if you're a black male high school dropout, you're much more likely to be living in a zone of concentrated poverty where you're going to be policed much more aggressively. So I would say uh, mass incarceration, remembering that just like mass education means that lots of people get college education compared to the past, it's still very unequally distributed. The other point to notice here, I think, is the importance of putting aside race for the moment, school. If, if you're black and you can get to college, you have reduced your chance of going to prison overwhelmingly. And, that's, and that is partly economic opportunity, but it's partly because your chance of being aggressively policed uh, and sucked into the system go down because you're in college. But even finishing high school, look at this difference, right? So going from um, two thirds of black male, young adult black males without a high school diploma in prison by the time they're 34 to less than a third just by finishing high school. Um, which suggests that public policies that encourage schools to keep people in school rather than kick them out for bad grades uh, would be a very good thing in terms of reducing mass incarceration. One of the consequences of our focus on school testing and improving school performance uh, through No Child Left Behind and other laws in recent years has been tremendous pressure on schools, especially big urban high schools, to push out kids that don't look like they're going to make it uh, who are going to hold down the test scores. Well, notice what's happening. When you push them out, you're greatly increasing the chances that they're going to be drafted uh, into the war on crime and end up uh, in uh, mass incarceration. Now, we've been talking thus far about the effect of inequality on sending you to prison and how that's changed over time. Let's again remind ourselves that all this inequality was there in the 50s and 60s, just at a lot smaller scale, right? That's the effect of mass incarceration. So um, so this is an interesting um, chart. It basically is looking at, um, so it's looking from 2006 at people who in 1986 we're in the bottom quartile of income earners, basically the poorest 25% of income earners. And this is from data that's part of the National Labor Department's uh, collection on uh, earnings and employment, right? And it's, it's asking um, 20 years, 19, 1986 to 2006, years that some of you may be looking a little bit enviously on because they were years of, of very strong economic growth compared to the current situation. But notice that for those people who were not incarcerated, um, 64, over 60% you know, of the people who were uh, in that bottom quartile uh, in 1986 ended up outside, above that bottom quartile in 2006. Right? We've heard a lot about not only income inequality in America, but the loss of mobility that used to be a society that was propelling people up the class system. Well, this is some evidence that was still true in the 1980s and 90s, and it's also some evidence that incarceration had a very big negative impact on that. So if you look at people that were incarcerated, who were in the bottom quartile in 1986 and then were incarcerated at some point, and then you look at them again in 2006, how many of them have made it out of the bottom quartile? Amazingly, about a quarter of them, which it seems a lot to me, but as you can see, a much smaller percentage. And if you compare being incarcerated uh, to other uh, features of a person that you might think would be associated with failure to, mo uh, to achieve mobility, for instance, having